Thank you very much for joining us this morning for the latest in our Breaking Ground series of mini webinars. Um, and today we're going to be focusing and talking about mitigation of loss clauses in the context of professional indemnity policies for construction professionals. So my name's Neil Howes, I'm a partner here at Mills and Reeve and one of the areas that I specialise in is defending construction professionals when they get sued for negligence. I'm joined this morning by my colleagues Alana Williams and Dan Korch, uh, both of them are senior associates here at Mills and Reeve and again they specialise in construction and engineering risk cases. So before we start a very very brief bit of housekeeping um, today we're going to be having a look at mitigation of loss clauses. We're going to be talking you through how they work, uh, the key things to look out for, and then how they kind of translate into practice. We're going to be finishing at the end of the session with a very short case study and a bit of audience participation via polls uh, based around a real life case example. Um, and just a couple of things to note, um, we are recording this webinar so that it will be published later on our YouTube channel. And do please remember uh, that whilst you can see us, we can't see you. Okay, so let's make a start then um, and talk about mitigation of loss clauses. Um, what are they? What do they mean? Um, Dan. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, so mitigation of loss clauses, they're frequently found in insurance policies for contractors. And they're in place to sort of prematurely deal with issues that if they were left, they would otherwise turn into a claim. Reason for them, um, by getting in early and fixing the problem on what are normally live construction projects, is that it's better than leaving the issues to be discovered later and where the remedy might be more costly. The client's more likely to want the issue fixed by way of remedial works than it is to be compensated, for example, the loss in value in the land or the property. So I suppose in a way there are there are means by which insurers can potentially head off a bigger claim by funding remedial works at an earlier stage. Alana, what are the potential advantages uh, to doing that? Well, to the claimant employer, there is a benefit in engaging someone who already knows the project and who has the relevant subcontractor and consultant contacts because this is likely to mean the remedial works will start and complete more quickly. But it does, of course, depend on the strength of the relationship between the parties. Secondly, to the insured, early remedial works are beneficial because it gives the insured the opportunity to preserve the relationship going forward. And to insurers, it allows them uh, an opportunity to have greater control over the costs of the remedial works to ensure the costs are properly mitigated. Okay, so does that mean that an insured's own costs of remedial work are always covered by a policy? Well, it's a good question because, sort of strictly speaking, um, any costs incurred by an insured could fall outside the scope of an insuring clause um, because of the cover in the insuring clause is triggered by a claim against the insured. Uh, but costs to mitigate claim by their nature are incurred before a claim is received. Uh, sort of for this reason, PI policies sometimes specifically include cover for mitigation costs, and which allows the insured the opportunity to undertake remedial works, mitigate the risk of a claim being made, or at least potentially reduce the value of the claim that might subsequently be made against them. Okay, so we're going to pop up on the screen now an example of a fairly typical mitigation of loss clause taken from a contractor's PI policy. And what you'll see is that we've highlighted in purple uh, a number of key elements within the, uh, within the clause itself. In other words, I suppose the essential elements that need to be satisfied in order for the clause to kick in and for cover for remedial works to be provided. Um, Alana, can you talk us through that in a bit more detail? Yes, so the wording of these clauses does vary from policy to policy, but this is a typical example of such a clause. It covers the insured for costs incurred for the purpose of mitigating a claim under the insuring clause or mitigating a likely claim that would otherwise have been covered under the insuring clause. Okay, is it worth just breaking that down a little bit more? Sure. Well, the clause will usually make it clear, as it does in this example wording, 
that cover for mitigation costs will only be provided where the insured has already notified the matter and also sought insurer's consent before incurring any such costs. Okay, so we talked about the fact that there are various kind of essential elements, if you like, within the clause that need to be satisfied. So it might be worth just having a very brief look at those. Um, the first is about insurer's consent. So you'll see from the wording on the slide that this clause contains an element that says insurers will indemnify the insured in respect of costs and expenses reasonably incurred with the prior written consent of insurers. So, Dan, talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, so, so generally speaking, notifications and consent under a policy of insurance are required to be in writing. Um, so sort of seeking to contain consent over the phone is normally not likely to be sufficient. Uh, and why would insurers include this? Why do they want to be notified of their consent to be obtained first? So if you sort of require consent, this makes sure that insurers can become involved in the issue at an early stage. And that's quite critical because um, insurers will want to make sure the insured actually did something wrong, which justifies a payment being made and which might entail, for example, instruction of an appropriate expert funded by the insurers uh, to have a look at the issues. Insurers will also want to ensure that any remedial works which are proposed, uh, they're reasonably priced and that they're actually going to work and solve the problem. OK, so let's have a look at the next essential element from, from this example clause. Um, so what that element is about is uh, the works must be needed to rectify practical prior to practical completion or during any defects liability any parts of the works already constructed by the insured. So there's this reference in there to practical completion, defects, liability periods. What does that all mean? Yes, yeah, so in this particular wording, there are two periods of time within which the insured can seek to recover mitigation costs. The first during the period before practical completion and the second during the defects liability period. The practical completion date will be the date the practical completion certificate is issued for the project and the relevant defects liability period will be defined in the particular construction contract. This period is usually between 12, uh, 6 to 12 months from practical completion, but it can be up to two years long. Okay, so are you likely to find this type of wording in all clauses? No, so it does vary. In some policy wordings, the clause is not restricted to the period before practical completion or to the defects liability period. Some wordings allow the insured to claim for costs for works to mitigate a claim or likely claim uh, right up to, say, uh, within the 12 year limitation period from the date of practical completion. So it is important to consider what period is captured by the clause in the relevant policy. Okay, so let's have a look then at the next kind of essential element in the, in the example clause. And, and that's the need for such rectification being due to the insured's negligence, which seems quite broad. Um, Dan, can you talk us through that? Yeah, so sort of taking a step back, the purpose of the, these mitigation of loss clauses is to limit the amount which might otherwise be paid under the policy. So as a sort of starting point, when interpreting what we might mean by this phrase insured's negligence, uh, you should look at the insuring clause and that might help you to determine what kind of claims are normally covered. And what does that mean, uh, I suppose, specifically in this context? Well, Professional indemnity policies, they're typically going to exclude claims that arise out of poor workmanship. Uh, and this is sort of something we touched on in our previous Breaking Ground seminar, and that's available back on our YouTube channel. Uh, but sort of a brief summary, though, negligence in this context is going to mean a breach of two things. So that's either a contractual obligation, so either express or implied, or it's going to be a duty of care owed in the tort of negligence. Uh, but for this clause in particular, though, it's quite important to note that this extends the negligent acts of subcontractors or consultants who were appointed by the insured. OK, so we've talked in kind of generic terms about mitigation of loss, but that is also quite an important element of these clauses, as you might expect. 
So uh, the cost to be paid out must be necessary to mitigate a claim or a likely claim that would otherwise have been insured under the insuring clause. So what are we talking about, Alana, when we talk about mitigating a claim? Mitigation essentially just means to reduce. So in this context, we're talking about an insured, <coughs> excuse me, taking reasonable steps to reduce the amount it might be liable to pay in damages. Insurers also want to ensure that the remedial scheme is no more expensive than is necessary, i.e. to mitigate the amount they have to pay. Okay, and um, could cost come into the equation as well? Yes, so uh, cost is definitely a factor. Um, doing remedial works early uh, allows savings to be made, which is of benefit to both insurers and the insured. Um, the insured is very likely to use trusted subcontractors in invoking this mitigation of loss clause and doing early remedial works uh, to undertake the works and therefore will be able to negotiate better prices for the works. Okay. So finally then, um, when we kind of look at the essential elements of the clause, uh, we're looking at prior notification, aren't we, as well? Um, so talk me through in the example clause then um, how that works in terms of prior notification. I think we might need to move on a slide. Yes. So in order for the sort of mitigation of loss clause to take effect, uh, and as we sort of set out in the example, it's common for it to require insurers to be notified of the existence of a potential claim. Okay, so um, how does that or does it matter whether a claim has actually been made against the insured or not? Well, in our last Breaking Ground seminar, we touched on the distinction between what is a claim and what is a circumstance for the purpose of the policy. In a mitigation of loss type scenario, we're more likely to be concerned with the latter, so a circumstance, particularly given the involvement is intended to be in an early stage and with a view to avoiding a formal claim rather than responding to one. Circumstances can be anything you know, from an initial complaint to discovery of an issue which suggests a claim is going to follow in the future. Again, though, this is going to depend on how circumstance is defined in the policy. Okay. So let's talk about having looked at the essential elements which kind of engage the clause, if you like. Um, can we just have a look at how that might operate in practice? Alana, what are the pros and cons of, uh, of the cover under this clause? In terms of advantages, Neil, as I touched on earlier, one of the main benefits for the insured of invoking this clause is to preserve the relationship with the client going forward to ensure the works are able to be completed without the client terminating the contract and hopefully to preserve the relationship if the parties are working together on other projects or hope to do so in the future. And it may also be important for reputational reasons for the insured. Okay, we've touched briefly already on the question of costs and how that comes into play. Does that mean it's generally more expensive to get a third party involved than it is for the insured to conduct its own remedial works? Yes, yeah, so we see that in nearly every case. If the remedial works have to be done later by a third party contractor, that third party is very likely to charge a premium for the works, including overheads and profit, which the insured cannot claim under the policy. Uh, third party contractors will also often allow a much larger contingency and they're not incentivized to provide a more cost or time efficient solution to remediate the issue or defect. So ultimately the sum claimed against the insured and claimed under the policy will generally be much greater. Okay, and what about the flip side? What about potential disadvantages? There are some potential disadvantages. So doing mitigation works does not preclude a claim being brought against the insured down the line. And insurers may also still wish to bring a subrogated claim against a subcontractor if considered to have been responsible for the issue or the defect. And presumably before insurers do provide cover under this type of clause, they, they need to kind of make sure and be satisfied that the insured has a liability um, that the remedial works are, are going to work and that the insured's entitled to an indemnity as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. So uh, in terms of how this works in practice, can you give an example perhaps of, of, of how it kicks in and how it helps? Yes, so as one example uh, of a claim our team was involved in, we acted in defence of a specialist cladding company uh, in relation to a project for the construction of a high-end residential apartment block, which had stone cladding. And in that case, unfortunately, the insured made the wrong choice for the grout materials for the cladding. And before practical completion, the stones started falling off the building. So in that case, the insured notified a claim under the policy and under the mitigation of loss clause, insurers reimbursed the insured for doing the works over a period of 17 months to remove the stone cladding and replace it with a stone held in place with the bracketing system. In that case, ultimately, the costs of the works undertaken by the insured was two thirds of an estimate provided by a third party contractor which mitigated the loss to insurers by several hundred thousand pounds. Okay, so we've had a look at what essential elements need to be satisfied, generally speaking, in order for a clause to kick in and provide cover. Um, we've had a look at what the advantages and disadvantages might be of, of going down this route. And um, we thought it would be helpful to um, finish with a case study, because of course there are scenarios where it's not always clear um, whether cover is engaged or not, and whether these essential elements in the clause has been satisfied. So the case study that we're doing is arising from uh, a reported case um, called Yorkshire Water, and the insurer on it was Sun Alliance. And it was effectively a, uh, a claim that arose out of Yorkshire Water operating a waste tip, and unfortunately that uh, churned out a whole load of sludge into a nearby river. One of its neighbours further down the river was ICI and the sludge in the river blocked up various pipes, caused no end of damage. And to mitigate that, Yorkshire Water just went ahead. They did a whole load of remedial works, uh, about £4.6 million pounds worth. And then they entered into a kind of settlement agreement with ICI and then sought to claim the money back from their insurers. So, uh, Dan, tell me a little bit more about the case and, and specifically the, the clause that became the issue here. Yeah, so first off, we're going to put on screen uh, the extract from the insurance policy, which was held by Yorkshire Water. It's quite important to note, though, this is taken from a public liability as opposed to the professional indemnity policy we considered at the start of this seminar. You'll see that this is kind of a very much simpler version of a mitigation of loss clause. But again, there's still a requirement for the insurer to obtain the insurer's written consent. There are quite a few number of exclusions in the policy, uh, one of which we've picked out here. And you'll see that indemnity will not apply to legal liability where such legal liability has been accepted by agreement unless such liability would have attached in the absence of such agreement. Okay, so having had a look at that, how did the case then unfold at first instance? So Yorkshire Water, they settled the claim that was brought by ICI, and then they asked their public liability insurers to indemnify them under the mitigation of loss clause in this policy. To support this claim for indemnity, Yorkshire Water informed its insurers that the effect of the settlement with ICI meant that liability was established for the purpose of the policy. Yorkshire Water claimed it was entitled to recover any compensation payable to ICI and any others, as well as the cost of the works from insurers. However, Yorkshire Water didn't notify its insurers of the existence of the settlement with the ICI until it had been reached, but claimed that the insurers did not engage in negotiations with the ICI when they were approached. Okay, so those are the kind of key issues at first instance. They've gone off, they've done the work, they've, uh, but they haven't told insurers about it in advance. And what's more, they've entered into a, a settlement agreement um, with ICI, which they say proves that they had a liability to ICI. So then let's have a look at this poll. And the first poll question should be coming up on your screen very shortly. So the questions are, what did the High Court decide? Did it say Yorkshire Water's settlement with ICI meant that they were entitled to recover under the policy? Or despite the settlement with ICI, Yorkshire Water wasn't entitled to recover all of these costs? 
that they had kicked out, uh, incurred um, in relation to that settlement. I can see the numbers going up. At the, at the moment we've got, it has to be said, one clear winner between the two answers. I'm just going to give it another 10 seconds so that everybody gets a chance to uh, have a go at the question. I think we're just about there. So we're going to end polling and share the results with you as well. A very clear winner. Uh, is that the vast majority of people felt that probably despite the settlement with ICI, Yorkshire Water wasn't entitled to recover what it had incurred under the policy. So, Dan, tell us what the court decided. Yeah, so everyone's on the money here. The correct answer was B. So High Court agreed with the insurers that Yorkshire Water couldn't rely on the settlement as establishing legal liability under the policy. So as it happens, and on the documents the court saw, it couldn't be shown that Yorkshire Water was liable to ICI, and as a result, there's no liability on the part of insurers. I think a bit of a key sort of take home from this is that insurers should be quite careful of being too quick to seek agreement on remedial works before they actually investigate legal liability first. Okay, so that, though, wasn't the end of the matter because Yorkshire Water decided to have another go, took the case to the Court of Appeal, and, and the essential argument that they ran at the Court of Appeal was to say, look, as an insured, we have an obligation to, I suppose, reduce as far as possible any amount that we claim under this policy. And therefore, there must be an implied term in the policy. Forget about what it actually said. There was an implied term, effectively, that insurer's prior written consent wasn't required. So we're going to run a second poll uh, to see what you think the Court of Appeal made of that argument. So... Uh, is it option A, the Court of Appeal agreed with Yorkshire Water, found that there was an implied term which meant that insurer's prior consent was, re was required, or the Court of Appeal rejected Yorkshire Water's arguments about there being an implied term? So have a go at that and let us know what you think. I'm going to give it 10 more seconds just for anybody who hasn't had a chance to click the buttons yet. We have a very clear winner. Um, I'm going to end the polling and share the results with you. But again, the vast majority of you felt that the Court of Appeal rejected Yorkshire Waters' uh, arguments. So, Dan, what did the Court of Appeal decide? Yeah, so it was option B again here. So unfortunately for Yorkshire Water, their arguments weren't entertained by the Court of Appeal. So whilst the decision was sort of based on a number of factors, um, big sort of takeaway here is that the Court of Appeal declined to imply a mitigation of loss clause, which did not require insurer's consent. So best sort of practice for insureds here is always going to be involving insurers at the earliest stage possible in order to make sure they're aware of the issues and that they're in agreement any sums which are paid out. Brilliant. OK, thanks for that, Dan. Um, that's all we've got time for. Uh, today folks um, thank you very much as ever for joining us and we hope that you found this session useful breaking ground uh, is going to be taking a break in august but we will be back with you in september uh, where our topic for the day will be dispute resolution methods and uh, construction disputes and we're going to be looking at things like uh, arbitration and expert determination and adjudication so we very much hope that you can join us then uh, in the meantime, enjoy your summer and have a great rest of the day.